Good evening. This is Jewish Philosophy Forum. And we will stop for a moment, half hour actually, to think about the crown of Torah. There are 613 mitzvahs in Torah, Taryag. And when we add seven, to the 613, when we get 620, the numerical uh, letters that, uh, that add up to 620 also spell out the word keser, crown, tofvesh chaf. So the crown of Torah are the 613 mitzvahs plus seven. And there are two opinions as to what those seven additional mitzvahs are. One opinion is that it's the rabbinic commandments. There are seven rabbinic mitzvahs, seven mitzvahs that were added after the Torah was completed, such as reading the Megillah on Purim. Obviously, that was not mentioned in the Torah. It came later. Lighting Hanukkah candles is a mitzvah that came later. So there are seven commandments that are rabbinic commandments, rabbinic mitzvahs. This is besides customs and traditions and so on. These are actual commandments over which we make a bracha. Um, Blessed are you, God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to do the lighting of the candles of Hanukkah or the reading of the Megillah and so on. Another opinion is that the additional seven commandments that make up the crown of Torah are the seven Noahide laws, the seven commandments given to all human beings, in addition to the 613 commandments given to the Jewish people. The seven Noahide laws actually began with Adam, Adam and Eve, because God gave Adam and Eve six commandments. The six commandments were, number one, not to worship idols. Number two, not to be blasphemous, not to be disrespectful to God or take God's name in vain, and so on. Number three, not to murder. Number four, not to steal. Number five, not to commit sexual sins, such as uh, adultery, incest, or homosexuality. And number six, was to have courts of law that would enforce the other five. These were the six commandments that God expected of all human beings at the beginning of creation, the beginning of history. And for a thousand years, from Adam, from Adam and Eve, until Noah, these were the laws, these were the commandments that governed the world. And we find in the stories of the Torah we find that these commandments were in effect. For example, Cain killed Abel, and God held him responsible and punished him for it, which means that there was already a commandment against murder. Uh, the people of Shechem kidnapped Dina, Yaakov's daughter, and her two brothers went in and killed every adult male because they held every adult male responsible 
for not enforcing the law against kidnapping, against stealing. So when, when the prince of Shechem stole Dina, kidnapped her, abducted her, and none of the adult male um, members of, of that society protested or took the prince to court, which means two commandments were being violated. One was against stealing, that was being violated by the prince, and then the one against, the one in favor of having courts of law, which they failed to do, this was a sin committed by all adult males who are obligated to create the courts of law. When Noah came around, there was a seventh commandment added. And that is that after the flood, when Noah and his family came out of the ark, God told them for the first time that it is permissible to eat meat. To Adam and Eve, God had said, from all the trees of the garden you may eat. He never gave them permission to eat meat. But after the flood, God gave Noah permission to eat meat. And at that time, he also told him that you may not be cruel to an animal. In other words, you may use animal for your nourishment, but you may not waste, you may not be cruel, you may not cause pain unnecessarily or needlessly or for sport or anything like that. And so those are the seven Noahide laws that God expects and demands of every descendant of Noah, which means all human beings. However, when Rambam records these seven laws and says that it is an obligation upon the Jewish people to teach these seven laws to the non-Jew and to see to it that everybody in the world obeys these seven laws, Rambam tells us that there's a condition. In order for a person to be a righteous human being, a righteous Gentile, by observing these seven commandments, there is a condition. And the condition is that you are righteous if you observe these seven commandments because of the fact that God asked you to do so in the Torah at Mount Sinai. But a person who observes the commandments for other reasons, for social reasons, philosophical reasons, or even historical reasons, he keeps the commandments because these are the commandments his great-grandfather Noah kept. And he feels some nostalgic attachment to them. This is not a righteous person. If somebody keeps the commandments because they make sense, they're rational, they're reasonable, they seem necessary for civilization to survive, this is not a righteous person. This is a practical person. To be a righteous person, you have to observe these seven commandments because God asked us to when he revealed himself at Mount Sinai through Moses. Now, why is that condition so important? Rambam actually says that a person who keeps the commandments for reasons other than revelation is not a righteous Gentile and is not wise pretty strong language. Why is it so important that we keep the commandments because God asked us to? Why not keep the commandments because the commandment itself is compelling, makes sense, seems right? The answer is the commandments were given to establish a relationship. The crown of Torah the 613 mitzvahs given to Jews and the seven commandments given to all people, this crown of Torah is a relationship. It's God making himself known to us. And our response in keeping the, uh, the commandments, in observing the commandments, that's our half of the relationship. 
when we take it out of the context of a relationship, when we start treating each commandment as a separate entity, and we consider each one of them, and we think, let's see, is this important? What does this do for me? What does it do for society? How does this work? Do we really need it? When we start to do that, we're, we're tearing the relationship apart. When a husband and wife, when best friends take care of each other, do for each other, are there for each other, they don't count. They don't sit there and count, how many favors have I done for you? How many favors have you done for me? What, what kind of favors have I done for you? I have, a, have big favors, heavy favors. And you've done for me little favors, insignificant. This is not a relationship. This is not a friendship. When the behavior, when the things that we do for each other dissolve into the relationship itself, that is healthy. That's close. That's called oneness. And God wants oneness more than anything else because he is one. It's been said about music, for example, that when an amateur performs at a piano, you hear the piano. You hear music coming from a piano. When a professional performs, you hear only the music. There is no piano. When a truly great performer performs, you hear only music, no piano, not even the musician. You are aware only of the music. Everything else melts. Everything else dissolves into the sound, into the movement of the music. So there is no performer, and there is no instrument. There is only the sound. That's what a good relationship is. In a good relationship, what we do for each other, how much we do for each other, it all disappears. It dissolves into the relationship itself. And all you see, all you feel, all you experience is the presence of that friendship, the presence of that relationship. And so with God's commandments, when God says, keep this commandment, observe this law, He's not talking about a specific law. He's not talking about an individual commandment. He is saying, this is me. This is our relationship. This is how we come together. This is how we become one. When God tells us his needs and we respond selflessly, then we lose ourselves in that relationship. When you lose yourself in a relationship, you're not counting. You're not keeping score. You're not looking for a reward because it all dissolves. So when we're told that we have to keep the commandments, not because each one of them makes sense, not because they're necessary, not because they have historical value, but because God asked us to at Mount Sinai, meaning to say, this is how we engage in this relationship. Without the relationship, even if we keep the commandments, we are remaining separate. We remain separate worlds, separate universes. <clears throat> we remain a human being doing good. And that's not good enough. The commandments were not given to make us good. So when we say a person who observes the seven Noahide laws is a righteous person, it's not that keeping the laws are meant to make you righteous. That's not their purpose. We keep the laws. The laws are there. The laws are given because this is what God needs out of his creation. This is what God needs from us. 
when we do it for that reason, then we are righteous. But when we start doing it for the purpose of being righteous, then we have not only failed to make contact with God the way it should be, but we've actually stolen his commandments. Rachel, Rachel couldn't stand her father's idolatry. So when she was leaving her father's home, she stole the idol. She took the idol with her. And her father got really upset, and the Torah says, he complained and asked, who stole my God? Now, obviously, you can't steal God. But there is a way in which we can abduct God's commandments. We can steal them. We can abscond with his commandments. We take the Ten Commandments, take his name off it, and make believe they're ours. We observe the commandments because we think they're great ideas. As people often say today, I don't have to believe in God. I know right from wrong, which is really adding insult to injury. First, you steal the commandments and then insist that they're yours, that you don't need God to tell you right from wrong because you already know right from wrong. But how do you know right from wrong? Because you read the Ten Commandments, or somebody read the Ten Commandments. So when we do the mitzvahs for reasons other than the fact that God asked us to do it, this is not only injury, this is also insult. Because we're taking what is most precious to God and treating it as if it was just some good idea that makes life more livable. And although that's true, all the commandments make life more livable. But to think that that's why they were given is to deny God's interest, God's investment in these commandments. And that's blasphemy. So these seven Noahide laws, which when observed, make the person a righteous person, is a very, um, is a very crucial aware, uh, uh, fact, a very crucial thing to be aware of, because without it, we end up getting very frustrated. When people say, how do I know whether I'm good or not? How do I know whether I've accomplished anything at all in my life? For all my efforts, after trying, after being good, after being selfless, after dedicating myself to good things, to being good, am I good? Am I OK? Did I accomplish anything at all? Or if I commit one sin, does that undo all the good I've ever accomplished? And does that mean that I'm still an evil person? So we're waiting for some kind of confirmation, some kind of an experience that will tell us that we're good. But that's very frustrating. And if somebody should claim to have had that kind of experience, can you trust that experience? Is it real? Is it genuine? Is it imaginary? When the Torah tells us there are seven commandments, they're not imaginary. They're not in our minds. They're actual, factual, measurable, observable. You keep the commandments. If you observe these seven commandments, then you are righteous. You are righteous. Not a matter of guessing and not a matter of estimation. You are factually, tangibly, a righteous person. If you're failing in one of these seven commandments, if you're lacking in one of these seven commandments, that too is identifiable. It's measurable. Figure out which one you're failing in and correct it. Fix it. There's no mystery here. There's no guesswork. It's all very real, very tangible. And that is absolutely necessary for a human being to be able to function, we need to know where we stand. We need to know what's happening. We cannot live 
with the unknown, with, uh, with a morality that is, that is vague and uncertain. Again, the commandments were not given to make us feel righteous. And we shouldn't use them for that purpose. But we are human beings. And when we devote ourselves to being good and we try to be good, we need to know that the good is real. And that if we try to be righteous, we are righteous. And then we can forget about that. Then we can move on, move beyond that, let that go, and then do what we need to do and c keep the commandments because it's part of our relationship with God, not because we want to be righteous. And that's called going beyond the letter of the law. <clears throat> In the letter of the law, you keep two commandments. You are two degrees of righteous. You keep seven commandments. You are a hundred degrees or completely righteous. That's the letter of the law. Beyond the letter of the law means you keep the commandments and the righteousness doesn't count at all. You're not interested in that. You're interested in what lies beyond the letter of the law. And beyond the letter of the law is also not some outer space darkness mystery. Beyond the letter of the law is very simply the giver of the law. So when you're keeping the letter of the law, you're responding to the commandment, and you notice the effects of the commandment. And that's why more commandments, more righteous. Less commandments, less righteous. When you go beyond the letter of the law, you're not focused on the law or its effect. What you're focused on is the giver of the law. So that when you do the commandment, you're actually doing the commander, not just the commandment. As, as we said before, the commandment dissolves into the relationship so that all you sense and all you feel is the godliness of the commandment, not the letter of the law. If we did that in our relationships, in our marriages, in our parenting, if the details dissolved into the relationship itself, we would have very healthy relationships. Somebody asked me, how many children do you have? I told him a f quite a few. He said, isn't that a lot? Isn't that too much? If you start counting children like potatoes, one potato, two potato, then two children is too many. But when it's your family, you don't count. It's not a materialistic um, it's not put together of numbers. You have a family, and that's not too much. Everybody's entitled to a family. <coughs> so you don't count. And the same is true with commandments. Are 613 commandments too many? If you're counting, 10 commandments is too many. If you're counting, seven commandments is too many. Two commandments is too many. Adam and Eve had one commandment, and it seemed to be too many. But we don't count. It's a relationship. As King David says, this is my God, and I will glorify him. How do I glorify God? By doing his commandments. But then if I'm glorifying him, I don't count commandments. I count only the relationship. And there's only one relationship. We have only one God. 
And if I'm doing 613 commandments for, for God, or if I'm doing two commandments for God, it, you don't count. The numbers don't mean anything. They all dissolve into the relationship itself. So that's why Rambam tells us that it is a crucial condition in the performance of the seven Noahide laws to make a person righteous. It must be performed in response to God's commanding it, to God's asking for it at Mount Sinai when God told us about himself. When we respond to that, when we do the commandments in response to God being open and intimate with us, and we respond to that in, in like measure, we don't count the commandments, but we respond to the relationship itself, then not only is the person who is doing the commandments a righteous person, but we are accomplishing the purpose for which God created the world in the first place. To make the world inhabitable, not only for, us, for ourselves, not only for other human beings, to make the world inhabitable for God. That God should be comfortable with Earth. God should be comfortable in this physical universe. Because the physical universe has entered into a relationship with him where the details dissolve. And so the finiteness, the, the pettiness, the smallness of the physical universe dissolves into a relationship with God and it makes the physical, finite, tiny little universe comfortable for God himself. And so we have a world of godliness. We have a home for God in the lowest world, which is why God created the world in the first place. <clears throat> By keeping the seven commandments, we also create a universal oneness. When Jews are keeping the 613 commandments and all human beings are keeping the seven commandments, then the differences we have between ourselves also dissolve, since we are all involved in the same relationship. And although we do it in different ways, and we must do it in different ways because God asked us to have different ways of serving him, yet the fact that we are all committed and devoted to what God said at Sinai to all of us, and we are responding to his initiative when he came and made himself available to us and we are all responding to that gesture, to that closeness, to that openness that God gave of himself, then this unites us, this joins us, this makes it possible that there be real peace in the world, a true peace in the world, which is possible only when we have a common goal. As the prophet says, in the days of Moshiach, all nations will serve God with a common effort, with a shoulder to the same wheel. And that is true peace. <laughs>